Do you have a guardian angel? The answer is yep. yes. If you're a human watching this, God has appointed a guardian angel to you. And today we're going to look at 10 mysteries, 10 facts about your guardian angel. Now, the most common example of a guardian angel is that of George Bailey in A Wonderful Life. His angel was named Clarence, and your angel probably isn't like Clarence. How'd you know my name? Oh, I know all about you. I've watched you grow up from a little boy. What are you, a mind reader or something? <laughs> well, who are you then? Clarence Oddbody, AS2. AS2, what, what, what's that, AS2? Angel, second class. <laughs> It's also not the case that angels are dead people who somehow earn their wings. What happened to your wings? I haven't worn my wings yet. That's why I'm an angel second class. I don't know whether I like it very much being seen around with an angel without any wings. Oh, I've got to earn them. Guardian angels have been the subject of intrigue and fascination for centuries, even for millennia. They're seen as divine messengers, as guardians, in a way, they are the hand of God in our presence. And so we're going to begin right at the most important question of all, and that is, do guardian angels exist? And how do we know? It's deeply rooted in the sacred scriptures, in the Holy Bible, and it's part of traditional Christianity to believe that each person has a particular angel assigned to the care and protection of their body and their soul. These celestial beings, these ministering spirits, are assigned to be your safeguard. St. Basil the Great, who was an early church father in the Greek tradition, he died in the year 379. He said, Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd leading him to life. Point number two, is it in the Bible? What are the biblical foundations for guardian angels? The concept of guardian angels is solidly in Scripture. There's many verses. I won't go through all of them, but perhaps the most popular one is Psalm 90, verse 11. That's Psalm 91, if you're using the King James, which reads like this, For he hath given his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Now, this verse is, of course, applied to Christ, but by extension, it's applied to all of us. God has given angels charge over us. They are our superiors. We are their inferiors. Point number three, angels are servants of God. Guardian angels are portrayed as God's devoted servants. In fact, in the book of Revelation and other places in the Old Testament, the angels are in the council of God, around the throne of God, attending God particularly, and bringing messages and graces from heaven above down to earth. They execute the divine will, and they mediate between the spiritual realm and the physical realm. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 14, affirms this, and it says, Are they not all ministering spirits? sent to minister for them who shall receive the inheritance of salvation. The idea here is that angels minister to us. Now, the argument made in Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is far above the angels because he's the Son of God, but that's a whole no another video. If you want to learn more about Christ and his superiority to angels, please subscribe and look for my videos on Christ and the angels. Point number four. Guardian angels serve for personal guidance and your protection. So your guardian angel is there to assist you in times of spiritual and physical trial. And we see this in Acts chapter 12, verse 15. Here we see how St. Peter's guardian angel intervenes for Peter's miraculous release from prison. And this exemplifies the power of guardian angels in your life. There are many people, you can find them on YouTube, who have had experiences of their angel intervening to protect them. Point number five, your guardian angel was assigned to you at conception. The moment a sperm came, 
to an egg, fertilized it, a human life was created. God gave a soul immediately to you. And not only did he give you a soul, which is which forms your body and soul, that makes you, he also appointed an angel, a guardian angel to be your special protector. We read about this. Jesus himself talks about this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, where Jesus says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father who is in heaven. You see, the little ones, the children, Jesus is talking about the little kids. He's saying that they each have an angel, and each one of their angels sees the face of the Father, sees the face of God. Those guardian angels are protecting the little ones, but they're looking into the divine countenance of God as protectors. Yet another verse showing the reality of guardian angels, even for little ones. Now, we are halfway through. That's the first five points, the first five mysteries. We've got five more to go. My name is Dr. Taylor Marshall. Welcome to my podcast. If you're enjoying this, please give this video the thumbs up. Like it. Also, please consider subscribing for more great content on this, on philosophy, theology, history, all these topics I cover here on the podcast. So go ahead and hit the subscription button, click the bell, and you'll be notified of more videos to come. Point number six on guardian angels, kind of already mentioned number five is, not only are they appointed to you from your conception, but they protect children in particular. We saw this in the teaching of Christ above that their angels look into the face of the father. And it's very important for parents, you know, Parents, mothers and fathers, my wife and I, we have eight children together. We can't always be with our kids, our adult children, our little children. Sometimes they're prevented by travel. You're away from your children. It is very important to be aware of your guardian angels. When we travel as a family, when we get into the car, we pray to God to protect us and to send his angels around us to protect us. And also, when you're away from your children, it's a very good devotion, very wholesome to pray to God and say, God, please send your guardian angels, strengthen them to protect my little ones. And one other thing that I do, it's not related to little ones, is sometimes when I'm having a meeting with someone, I'll send my guardian angel ahead and say, hey, meet up with their guardian angel, make this meeting go well. And that brings us to point number seven on the guardian angels, and that guardian angels are perceived as sources of guidance in proper decision making. We see this in the story of Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. He's in a dream and he sees angels ascending and descending on a certain spot. This is where we get the idea of Jacob's ladder, and that guides him to set up an altar stone there, and it, it really sets the direction for his whole life. And that shows us that angels, our guardian angels, can intervene and confirm things that we are struggling with. In this case, it was in a dream. You see this with St. Joseph in the New Testament. His angels coming to him and guiding him. Go to Egypt, protect Mary and the baby Jesus. All of this protection and this guidance is being given to key people in the Bible, and to you as well in your decision-making. Point number eight on the garden angels is that we are to honor angels, we respect angels, but we do not adore angels or worship angels as if they are divine gods or God themselves. The New Testament is very, very clear on this. St. Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 says, Let no man seduce you, willing in humility and religion of angels. We also see a similar warning in Galatians, the book of Hebrews. Angels are servants of God, but angels are not gods. And as you maybe look into the New Age or Kabbalah or some of these esoteric philosophies and theologies, you'll find an unhealthy obsession with angels and even the worship of angels. This is not 
the Christian way. This is not what we find in the Holy Bible. There's also another mistake that people make, and that is they name their guardian angel. Here on the podcast on YouTube, I have a whole video on why you should not name your guardian angel. Why is that? Your guardian angel is your superior. You are the inferior. You don't name your superior. Your guardian angel is not your pet. It's not like your dog or your cat that kind of follows you around, right? That's not how it works. Your guardian angel is above you. So to name a superior is not fitting. It's like a dog giving a name to his master. There's a message in my alphabet. It says, ooh. Peter, those are Cheerios. It's totally backwards. We honor our guardian angel simply as our guardian angel. You don't have to give him a name. Point number nine on guardian angels is guardian angels have a very important place in church history. If you read church history, you'll see that guardian angels are appearing all over the place. There's not just a guardian angel for each person, you watching right now, me. There are also guardian angels for nations we see in the book of Daniel. And tradition states there's also guardian angels for each and every city and town and place. Some have even speculated there's a guardian angel for each home, for a family together. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I've heard it. So guardian angels appear throughout church history. A very famous account is when there was a horrible plague in Rome. This was around the year 600. And the people of Rome went around with St. Gregory the Great, who was the Pope of Rome. They were carrying an image of the baby Jesus and the Virgin Mary. And as they were coming across the Tiber River, they saw the angel up high. And that angel put a sword in the sheaf. And in that moment, the plague ended because the angel came. That's just one example in church history. But we also have many saints and many great theologians who talk about the importance of your guardian angel. For example, St. John Chrysostom, who died in 407, he says, he quotes scripture, the Psalms, he has given his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. He says, these words should fill you with respect, inspire devotion and instill confidence, respect for the presence of angels, devotion because of their loving service, and confidence because of their protection. St. Jerome also says, he died in 420, St. Jerome says, quote, How great the dignity of the soul, since each one has from his birth an angel commissioned to guard it. The great St. Thomas Aquinas, and by the way, if you want to take online courses on philosophy, theology, and history, go to NSTI, New St. Thomas Institute. That's where I teach online courses based on the angelic doctor himself, St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas says this about garden angels, quote, the angel is the ambassador of God appointed to watch over the life of each person and lead them to good. Accordingly, each person, if it is worthy of eternal life, has an angel as his guardian, end quote. And then there's a great quote from Padre Pio, St. Pio, who died in 1968. He's the stigmatist famous mystic, he says, quote, don't forget the guardian angel. Invoke him, pray to him. It is in his power to do much for us, and we ourselves must make room for his action. Allow it, end quote. And point number 10 on the guardian angels is that the guardian angel provides you encouragement and comfort. Think about it. If you are sad, scared, alone, at night, during the day, anywhere, you know that in your presence is your angel. God has always sent someone. You can't see him, but there's always someone who is all good, all true, who is connected to God, looking into the face of God, who is present with you. In times of adversity, the idea of the guardian angel gives you solace, gives you peace. And the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 2 says, In hospitality do not forget, for by this some, being not aware of it, have entertained angels. 
There are certain encounters you may have had in your life where you thought you were dealing with just another human person. And in the actuality, that was an angel of God, perhaps your angel of God, right there in your presence helping you. And he says, you can be hospitable to that angel in your presence. A few verses later in Hebrews 13, we read, let your manners be without covetousness, contend with such things as you have, for he have said, I will never leave thee, never will I forsake thee. It's true, God is always present with us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe in Jesus Christ, you confess the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you avoid sin, Jesus is with you. But also, there is this direct ministering spirit that is also with you. This is part of the communion of saints. It's not just the human holy ones, it's also these angelic holy ones that are with us. Thanks for watching these 10 points. I hope it was helpful to you. If you'd like to learn about the seven archangels of the end of the world, their names and what they do, check out this video on the seven archangels. And if you wanna hear Joe Rogan's five objections to Jesus Christ, check it out in this video. Thanks for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Till next time, God bless.